Hello, hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're listening from. I want to welcome you back to my channel. I am Dr. Yunis Menja and I am so excited to have you join me for another lesson. So whether you are a long time subscriber, you are here for the first time, I want to welcome you to my channel. I want to ask you if you like this video, you can um, put a yeah, you can put an emoji, you can uh, comment, you can like uh, whatever you want to support me, uh, so that I can know that you liked it. Um, if you have any questions, please ask me. I am definitely uh, thrilled again um, to bring this lesson to you. Um, so feel free to share. Um, if you need to, if you are here because you are required to watch this video for a certain class, especially for my uh, introduction to sociology university students, I want you to know that this information is very important. So please get your pen and paper and take notes. Um, so we are going to be um, continuing from our previous lessons. And this is lecture five. I want to talk about um, introduce um, the health and medicine uh, and aging in relationship to what course you are doing, especially if you're in occupational therapy or if you are in medical health or mental health. Um, this this course or this subject is actually supposed to show us how it ties to um, our sociology. So without further ado, I want to start. I am going to explore some of the social factors that influence health outcomes, the dynamics of medical sociology, the societal implications of aging in our country, Kenya, and other surrounding countries um, so that we can see how we can tackle this topic especially in the in relationship to health um yeah so that's what we are going to be looking at focus on occupational therapy um major and other health uh, degrees or areas and we look at the social determinants um health medical sociology aging and this is in kenya and as well as in the other countries that i'm going to talk about and of course i will have my resources at the end um the, fa the last slide will be where i have gotten this information from so i've taught this call this course many many times but this time i'm tweaking it just for um application in medical and mental health. Okay, so let's talk about the social determinants of health. Um, there are factors beyond individual biology. If you remember when you talked about DNA and how um, a child is conceived, a baby a fetus is conceived in the baby's womb and uh, brought into this earth carrying the DNA. Um, so the social determinants of health are definitely uh, factors that are different from biology or even lifestyle choices that significantly impact um, uh, one's health. So take socioeconomic status, for example, in countries like Kenya, as in many other global um, individuals from lower socioeconomic status backgrounds will face certain barriers to accessing quality healthcare. Resulting in disparities in health outcomes. So for example, you know that there are places, especially like in the US where research has been done and shows that individuals from lower socioeconomic backgrounds are more likely to experience chronic health conditions due to limited access to healthcare and resources. And this is not just the care that you you get when you get sick 
it is even that care that you get before you get sick like the preventative measures go to the doctor and get screened for free to just to make sure that you don't have um you know you don't have something that is developing in your body you know your blood sugar your your blood pressure and other things can be checked if you have insurance or if you have access to uh, medical coverage um so we can't look overlook the influence of uh, race and ethnicity on health as well because in countries such as america or places like south africa um, racial minorities often experience you unequal access to healthcare services leading to poorer health outcomes com- compared to their white counterparts um, in the usa for example african americans and hispanic populations are known to have higher rates of diabetes and hypertension compared to white Americans due to systemic inequalities in healthcare access and quality. Uh, Think about even just poverty itself alone is going to make these populations have poor diet. Uh, And of course, poor diet leads to, um, you know, poor health. And then without the access for uh, the screening and um, you know just having a primary doctor access you know being able to access a primary doctor because of uh, limited income those can also um, contribute to a lot of um, other situations so gender also plays a, a pivotal role in health disparities globally we know that women face unique health challenges than inequalities in accessing healthcare services. For example, in countries like Pakistan, India, you know, even Africa, cultural norms sometimes restrict women ac- you know, access to healthcare, um, impacting their health, seeking behavior, and overall well-being. We must strive for gender equity in healthcare provision in Kenya and anywhere else globally. In countries like Kenya, women are more likely to experience mental health issues such as depression and anxiety, partly due to societal pressures, hormonal imbalances and gender roles. You know, those are common things that happen to every woman. But if you are living in a country where healthcare is not accessible to you, then they might have more impact on you. You know, the birthing process, postpartum depression, and, uh, you know, you have ill children who are young and you have to stay awake most of the night because maybe you are your new mother, you are nursing all night um, and, you know, what we call breastfeeding. Um, you know, all day your child is sick and you have to take care of them. It can compromise women's health. And, you know, it starts by dropping the, you know, you don't have enough time to sleep. And you, you, are, you have too much stress, the immunity health, the immunity level or immune, your immunity is going to go down. And of course, you are exposed to more, uh, you know, diseases than, you know, if you didn't have a child. So obviously that doesn't favor, um, you know, childbearing women, especially. Um, The other factor, of course, we're going to be talking about medical sociology, um, you know, shifting our gears, um, looking at uh, medical sociology. One of the aspects to consider is the social construction of illness. So different cultures have distinct interpretations of health and illness. Um, We know like in the Western societies, definitely mental health disorders are increasingly recognized and uh, destigmatized. You know, we don't have as much stigma, um, you know, like we there used to be before in terms of people who are suffering from mental health. While in uh, some African countries and even Asian cultures, mental health issues may still carry a very huge or significant stigma. That stigma affects people from 
you know, seeking treatment. Uh, people not saying that they are sick, someone not saying that I am depressed, you know, someone might not say that they don't feel well because it is going to be uh, interpreted to something else. So you may have heard someone say, even, you know, in a place like Kenya, that so-and-so has a mental illness because he has been bewitched by his family or her family. Uh, sometimes it's maybe the, you know, the man hasn't done one, two, three things in the village or where he got married, you know, never paid dowry or things like that. And, you know, so people are relating to not doing those things to uh, somebody's uh, mental health uh, issues. So there are efforts to reduce the stigma surrounding mental health um, all over the world. Um you know, that uh, ha have led to increased awareness and access to support services for individuals who are experiencing mental illnesses. So there is, you know, all of us have a duty to continue doing this awareness and creating awareness and trying to change the narrative around mental health and why people get sick because people don't get sick because they are spiritual people don't get mental health illness because they have been bewitched it's just it's a it's an illness um like any other illness so we're gonna we're gonna talk about the um what that is especially when it comes to doctor patient relationship is also, another critical aspect to look at when you're talking about health, um, cultural competence in healthcare delivery is very, very important. Ensuring that healthcare providers understand and respect the cultural beliefs and practices of their patients. Uh, this is one thing that I have been trained very well. I can say, as uh, someone who is a marriage and family therapy candidate, this is something that you have to have cultural competence. In countries like America, Canada, and Australia, healthcare systems emphasize cultural competence training for healthcare professionals to ensure effective communication and also patient-centered care. Because we don't treat people from a um, cultural point of view, we treat people from their cultural point of view. So, in uh, you know, in the U.S., the initiatives to promote cultural competence among healthcare providers have been aimed to improve healthcare access and outcomes for diverse populations. Um, and that includes the immigrants and also um, minority groups. And of course, um, this is something that you have to go through and be tested. You have to do this exam that actually has to, you have to demonstrate that you have, um, you have that ex uh, competence, cultural competence before you can be licensed to practice um, in the medical, um, field. Um, so continuing with uh, medical sociology, um, I want to talk about even a place like Kenya, uh, where we can say that diverse healthcare landscape, you know, that compromise, compri comprises both public and private providers. We know the public provider right now in Kenya is the NHIF, Nas National health insurance fund which we all call nhif and we have private providers insurance companies insurance companies like jubilee britam and others um so there are challenges still uh such as our inadequate infrastructure we know that there are people that probably would like to enroll in nhif and maybe they still have challenges because you know now we know that everything is in citizen how are we making sure that the people in the villages have access to um you know that portal so that they can be able to you know to uh, enroll how much um, grassroots education has been provided for them to know that they can access their um, NHIF benefits from wherever they are. So an equal distribution of healthcare resources and financial barriers and poverty that continue to persist in developing countries can also have um, impact on who gets the chance to be uh, to be covered by even the private or the uh, the public. Um, providers for healthcare. So we want to continue to enhance uh, communication in occupational therapy or mental health settings 
uh, and also the medical health settings so that people can understand how to be able to access these uh, benefits from wherever they are and trying to just break the you know just break that barrier um, that could be preventing them from accessing the coverage that's very very important uh, we know places like countries like Sweden or Norway that have robust public health care systems um, they provide universal access to comprehensive health care services such as uh, potential models of for improvement, um, serving as a potential model for improvement. In the UK, they have the National Health Science, which is NHS, provides healthcare services to all residents, uh, regardless of their ability to pay, ensuring equitable access to healthcare for everyone. And I've heard many countries, like even Obamacare, the uh, United Healthcare, that you know it's being proposed in Kenya, and how does that benefit people who are um, who cannot afford it and they don't have income to pay for it. So when you're talking about aging a society, we're talking about um, it's very essential to understand the social construction of age. Cultural attitudes towards aging vary widely. So in some societies, older adults are respected while in others, they may face discrimination and marginalization. Uh, we know places like in Japan, for instance, the aging populations have prompted innovative approaches to elder care. Uh, that includes the development of robotics to assist with daily living tasks. So you can imagine a nursing home where there are older people that maybe they're not getting out of bed because of their age. And we have robotics, I mean, that are providing them um, you know, passing on the meals or passing on medication. And we've had that conversation that is going on even in the U.S. I know my own university where I got my bachelor's and my master's degree here in Oklahoma State. I, I remember reading somewhere on the news where they had gotten this grant to, um, the mechanical engineering department had gotten a grant to develop this robotics so that they can be used to serve the older generation because the older generation especially in, the, in America, it's very huge. Um, it's breaking the, um, you know, the healthcare system. So in the US, older adults often face ageism in the workplace, that's true, um, you know, leading to challenges in employment and financial security during retirement. Uh, we know even, even in our own countries like Kenya, older adults don't get to work at all. Um, in fact, U.S. is better because older people, after they retire, they can be hired. They are hired everywhere. Even, you know, you go to a supermarket, you find a greeter who's somebody who stands at the door is a very older person. You know, so long as they can, you know, they can start, they can stand. Sometimes they have chairs sitting on them, but they are just welcoming people and they're being paid to do that. Unfortunately, because of, you know, lack of resources and lack of employment, um, in African countries, you might not see older people returning to work at all. Uh, so once they retire, and regardless of how much knowledge they still have and some, how much wisdom they still have, they don't get to work anymore. And that can also affect the medical health um, or the medical care um, of the country. Because, you know, when you have older people retiring early and they don't have activities do, to do, that can impact their, uh, you know, their their mental health. You know, they get depressed, they get lonely. Um, you know, they get they have these uh, age, um, you know, appropriate diseases or illnesses that are just developing very fast. Especially things like Alzheimer's. We've heard about Alzheimer's or dementia, where people are forgetting, uh, they are they're forgetting or they're losing their memory, and that can really impact or overburden uh, the healthcare system for any country. So you have to be careful about how we treat and how we take care of our older population because uh, we want them to stay longer and share the experience, their, their wisdom. They, have, they still have a lot to offer even after their, um, they retire, right? Um, we all know that. So um, ageism is prevalent and it's something that faces this population a lot that discrimination based on age can limit access to healthcare and social services. 
So you find that even people who are supposed to provide the services to them, they are not available because maybe the older people cannot get to the health center. Um, and I hope that we do have community health workers that still go to check on the older people or the elderly population from their homes when they are sick. Uh, and of course, knowing that there's a lot of um, immigration into the urban areas and people have left the villages, it's no longer the same how um, you know, like in Kenya, we took care of my grand, we took care of my grandmother. We cared for whatever she ate. We made sure that she had food. We made sure that she had soap. We made sure that she had clean water to drink, and um, and we provided for her. I remember she was very instrumental in my life. She was she was she was a babysitter at one point in my home, and so we did take care of her when she grew older. But a lot of times you see that people are immigrating to the cities and leaving these older people and that can really impact their health um and also how we provide um we we provide services such as um occupational health so um let's consider the aging population in kenya like many countries uh where uh, experiencing dem demographic shifts, just like I have explained. Uh, so with that increase in proportion of older adults in the population, this demographic trend is going to necessi necessitate uh, proactive measures to address the healthcare needs and social support systems for older adults. Um, so obviously that includes the integration of occupational therapy, interventions to enhance quality of life and promote healthy aging. Even, even if we create what type of robots, we'll always need human beings. There has to be somebody who actually um, configures these robots to be able to work. So human beings cannot, complete, cannot be done completely with, um, they still be needed. So the there are places where like now everybody is immigrating to if you're a nurse if you can take care of older people you can get hired um so it's something to be thinking about even as as you do your degree um in terms of what what you want to do especially in helping with this with this crisis that are developing so something else to know is according to world health organization um, research on aging and cognitive health in developing countries. Um, today we face the critical issue of aging in Kenya. You know, I don't, I can't tell you how many times I have taken care of, I have met people in my clinic that are going through dementia. Uh, that wasn't a very common disease for us Kenyans. Uh, you know, people losing their memory so early, as early as 60, uh, 65 people have started to lose their memory and this is not just memory they are losing their memory in such a sh you know a short span of time and it, it progresses so fast to alzheimer's and you know that point where somebody has to become fully or 100 percent de dependent on um on other people uh so from previous lessons i must say that aging intersects with development whether it's the social cognitive or emotional that we've been talking about the development that we've been talking about intersects with social and economic factors and you know there is that huge strain uh, that is occurring on medical and mental health services so aging populations demand adaptation in healthcare and social services and as well as economic opportunities um you know we know that of resources are are very scarce so cognitive changes are going to accompany um aging posing the challenges in the societies that we're seeing now you know the demand for occupational therapy services mental health services uh, you know with that limited healthcare access is going to be very very difficult on a lot of aging population so aging contributes to socioeconomic disparities leading to poverty and social isolation so the crisis in medical and mental health services further is burdens um, aging population and overwhelms healthcare workers in each country. So there's no doubt about that. It's not just America or Canada or um, you know UK, even Kenya is feeling the burden uh, to under to address these challenges. So the governments of each country need to really prioritize 
in investing in healthcare infrastructure, uh, destigmatizing aging and mental health issues, and also fostering culture of empathy and inclusion. Um, and just making sure that even the healthcare um, providers, the you know the occupational therapists, the nurses, the uh, the doctors in the hospitals, and everybody that is providing anything that is medical related or other social services are aware about the the shift in the uh, the edge uh, constru uh, construction and making sure that the older people are taken care of. So I'm very thankful that through my teaching at these courses, such as Introduction to Sociology, Clinical uh, Psychology, and even uh, Population Development, I've taught that course many, many times at Jomo Kenyatta University, and uh, courses like Cultural Diversity. I know that through the teaching, I am playing a role in helping my students understand why they will need to advocate for their clients as well as their communities and at the global arena because we talk about the uh you know the the world being a global village and that's really what it is so wherever you're gonna end up working whether you graduate jomo Kenyatta university and decide to do to do your masters or go into politics and where you can make policies or even um you know go into the field and work or even go outside the country it's very very important that you're aware of these issues um and how they relate to each other and because it's social services development and distribution need to be fair um for each country thank you so much for watching uh and i hope that you enjoyed um go ahead and share my video if you like um save and you know you can always come back to it because i think it's a conversation that needs to continue happening not just for students to pass a course but um just to make sure that we are taking care of the of the things that i have highlighted so thank you very much and have a good day bye bye